We are just over halfway through the Thunder Junction preview season and social media has been ablaze with people having hot takes and opinions about Magic's latest Magic set. Full transparency though, we are at the end of the week for the main set and we should have all of it by the end of day tomorrow and then we're going to have big score, big news, all the other extra slots next week alongside the Commander decks. And so far, I feel a little bit disappointed of what we've got if I'm honest. So today I want to talk about my first impressions of the set from a, not from a mechanical or gameplay perspective, a lot of these cards are going to be fun and powerful in older formats, so I'll probably come more to that part around release where I make videos about that sort of stuff. But today, I want to talk about Magic as a um, as a product, it's, its ongoing story, its ongoing feel, the vibe, a vibe check if you will, and how some of the problems with Thunder Junction generally aren't just with Thunder Junction. They're issues that Magic is still teething with, still struggling with. All that and more in this lower energy, I've got a horrible cold video. If you want to pick up a single or sealed product for Thunder Junction, you can do so via Cool Stuff Inc. using my link in the description below or the code Kenobi at checkout to get 5% off your order. And if you want more of me, don't forget I also stream on Twitch. I have been on a slight hiatus with just family things and so on, but I am coming back in April. April 8th marks my first big Twitch stream or back on the platform playing all the good stuff, all the old formats. Probably on Modo, if I'm honest, because that's because we can play Legacy and Vintage and Cube. And my entire stream is facilitated via Elgato, one of my main sponsors on the channel, and they provide me with our lights, the camera interface against this beautiful 4K camera, my stream deck set up for instant access to things like lights and sound levels, and all the tech I use to record my audio, like this wonderful XLR. If you want to upgrade your setup for home computing, for content creation, for streaming, or for just gaming in general, check out my link in the description below for Elgato products. I've loved them since before they sponsored the channel. Check out the link in the description below to help support the channel and pick up your Elgato products today. Let's start at the top of the most surface level criticism of Outlaws at Thunder Junction, which I'm kind of in agreement with. That the set is a novelty set where characters we know and the creatures we expect are now wearing pirate hats. Sorry, no, sorry, I meant um, Detective Forest. No, sorry, I meant um, cowboy hats. Honestly, the excellent's probably a good example of how the novelty things don't override the overarching narrative. And they actually went to great lengths to create an interesting and compelling idea of a race to the center of the earth, an ancient artifact, a civilization that is protecting said artifact, and ancient invaders and elopers from across the multiverse. Then we have the clue set, which I will still defend a little bit, but not hugely. Markov Manor, I think, did its theme better simply because we were returning to an established plane. We had characters we knew of that were there, that made sense that they were there. We were back on Ravnica, a cool backdrop for a lot of storytelling in different genres. That's why I defend the detective fiction thing so much. However, half the cards are literally just famous creature type or infamous creature type from Ravnica with a cowboy hat. Sorry, I meant Detective Fedora. All the hats are getting confusing. One of the pervading online narratives from people who are really circle joking the hate train is that this set was designed primarily to sell Clue, or Cluedo if you're from the old world, to new customers. But let's be honest, no one's buying fucking Clue because they played a game of Magic. That's just not happening. It's a bullshit excuse to moan about what's here as a company. There's so much more to moan about without having to make stuff up. That said, I actually got to play with this with some friends and I actually think it's really good. But generally, I think adding the guessing game, mind game element of Clue to the proceedings and having some themed pieces is actually really fun. It translates very well. If anything, it sold me more on the murder mystery like tie-in of Markov Manor in general. I think Clue Edition actually elevated the set in my mind. It's sad that it was a $60, $100, how much were these fucking boxes again? I actually had to go check, it was £65 that I bought this fucking thing for, for eight randomized boosters and a load of commanders that can only be gotten in this product. There was too much of a, come buy some randomized shit that might not give you what you need, rares that are still chaseable, and then a load of FOMO stuff too, to make this really a product that I absolutely loved, even though I actually thought the playing of it was very fun. And also look, it says Cluedo on top of it. If anything, I would love to have seen the murder mystery shit just be a free thing you did at your game store. That would have been much cooler than all this like sort of randomized booster shit that they added into it. And to their credit, they are doing an outlawry thing where you collect bounties and get treasures at game stores as part of the release of Thunder Junction. Some of the stuff they're doing with Thunder Junction is pretty good. But then we came to those initial spoilers, those initial previews, and it was just like Gissa and Marquesa and Karavek and all these other characters that just aren't from this plane. Sure, okay, Omen Paths allow travel between worlds, but this does not beg a million and one question. Firstly, are the Omen Paths only primarily used by people that we know the name of? People who appear in the EDH Rec Top 100? Where are the average Joes, the Vidalkins, and the normal people that we've seen on other planes? Why is Thunder Junction only exclusively named villains coming through the Omen Paths? On top of that, it does feel somewhat cheap to see all the same characters coming back again. We only just got Rakdos literally last set, and here he is again in this set. But some other demons in magic to be drawn upon or alternatively you could look to expand your universe and your world by creating new characters that are interesting instead of going back to the same old well of the same old 
member berries. There is an element of diminishing returns, and there's an element of not really expanding your universe. It kind of feels a little bit odd when one of the chief criticisms you see online right now with universes beyond being tied into magic is that magic no longer cares about its own canon. And when you see something like this set, it's hard to argue it doesn't feel that way, at least slightly. It feels like cheap self-reference with a theme slapped over the top as opposed to any new ground being broached by the game at large. Beyond that, on top of Marquesa, people have joked a lot about this, that she's a queen. Why would she be on a random other plane? Well, I hate to inform you that even the queen is allowed to take holidays. Queen Lizzie's taking one right now. She's dead. But the bit that does make me laugh is that Queen Marquesa and other figures who are head of state or are leaders of huge entire factions and armies and worlds, they wouldn't necessarily be here on their own. Where are their bodyguards? Where are their armies? I've even seen some Vorthos enthusiasts looking to clutch at straws and just figure out some headcanon shit to excuse this weirdness, this weird vibe that we're all feeling. You know, this is like the central nexus of the Omen Paths. Why wouldn't they want to do a little, a territory grab? Sure, but should they do a territory grab with some troops and some soldiers? Why is it just like Tim, Bob and John? And then most of them are just wearing cowboy hats. On top of all this, I don't really feel like I'm getting a good insight to what the world looks like. Now, the rest of the set will drop in previews probably around this time tomorrow or maybe Monday, and thus I'll get a much better look via the commons and the uncommons. They do a little, normally a lot better job of selling me the world and teaching me about it. An example of this is something like Vengeful Townsfolk, where I see people carrying golden or yellow laden guns and crossbows which tells me about the weaponry of the civilization they're all pale and pallid i actually thought these were vampires at first that's a bit confusing are these caskets behind them i mean it's asking questions that i want answered but mainly we get a human who gets bigger as people die and then the flavor text says the sterling company says they protect us but where are they when the hell spurs burn half the town counting their vaults and that common with its flavor text and its art has just told me a million and one things about the set that other rares are just absolutely failing to do so for every colossal rattle world giving me a view of the kind of stuff that the denizens of Thunder Junction have to deal with in terms of local wildlife. There's a Riku of Many Paths, a character that has a little bit of fan favoritism due to him being one of the original Commander decks from 2011. I don't even know what plane he's from originally. I know so little about Riku himself, his backstory, and his own plane, that having him show up to then take the limelight away from the plane we're currently entering and exploring, it just feels like a, a farce, if anything. And another quick aside is that there just seems to be a lot of text on cards these days, and that's a really common complaint and I often think maybe is a bit overstated. For example, I don't really think crime is very hard to figure out or the, the outlawed posse things. It only matters when those cards are in play and they tell you what they are. But I want to use the example of Railway Brawler here. It's not a particularly large amount of text. I mean, Questing Beast has probably 50% more on it. But Railway Brawler is a 5 mana 5-5 five, five Rhino Warrior. It has two keywords and it has this extra text of whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control but X plus plus some counters on where X is its power. And then it has the mechanic from the set, Plot, which allows you to scheme ahead to play a card for free later down the line. All jokes aside, and all like bitterness and resentment aside, and just being really honest with one another, can someone tell me what this has to do with railways, brawling, cowboys, or the set at all, other than being one of the mechanics? I just don't really understand the flavour, the theme, or the reason for this to exist in the way it does. Even from a mechanical perspective, I don't really understand why you'd want this for free later. Maybe I'm missing some very niche, limited use of this. I, mean, I did this thing where I went back to sets that I remember fondly that were top-down, sort of like, you know, Disney theme of the week, like Theros, for example. And I look at the mythic. Metamai the Ageless, for example, it has no flavor text telling me what it is. But from art to its text, I know that it's got a personality and I know what it does. Master of Waves, no flavor text, I know what it does. All of this is such a cohesive and interesting card that really pulls together to tell me a story about what this guy is doing with these big frothing elementals. From mythical sphinxes to mythical hydras, all of these things feel like they fit within the space and help to not only tell their own story but but flesh out the world and be part of a cohesive mythical environment i think as we move towards more genres that are attached to modern day stuff things like man stood in kitchen holding saucepan like we saw in in doctor who or in this case people working kind of modern jobs you could you could work as security for a railway it, right now it's not really exactly a fancy thing i think it just becomes kind of like difficult to code in a way that's interesting or tells us much about the world beyond what the title of the card says nothing about even the r let alone the text on the card to me tells me anything about itself or the world it just feels like a load of game mechanic 
noise. Hythonia the Cruel was largely a forgotten mythic compared to the other two. No commander play, no modern play, but I still get it. She's a huge gorgon that turns everyone to stone around her thanks to the art, the in-game set mechanic, and the trigger it has. All of these cards have no flavor text to tell us more about them, but it tells us more about them just by the designs being intuitive and interesting. Even Stormbreath Dragon, which was quite clearly the most pushed mythic in the set for like constructive playability and doesn't tell that much of a story itself is... <sighs> Dare I say interesting? Like, this is what you get when you go to the upper ends of the food chain on Theros. Meanwhile, this rhino fights on the railway, for the railway. Is he a railway enforcer? The most interesting thing about him is that he has like a, a whip made out of horseshoes that's powered by thunder. An element that I don't understand yet because we haven't any cards to explain it. And that brings me nicely to my next point. I read the first two episodes of the, uh, uh, the, the story this morning and I liked them. I think like Callum saving a man as he's working on some frontier project with Raoul to set up a relay between worlds and using his powers to save someone is actually a really cool setup as he's telling this person after he saves them that he's looking for his dad. He has a heroic act then joins a, a, a villainous posse. Honestly, pretty damn solid. I might even fuck about and read the rest of them. But there's a drum that I want to keep banging is that storytelling doesn't need to come through web comics or full-on text displays of short stories and novels. I think a lot of the storytelling and if we change the wording, the world building should be done through the cards themselves. Bruce Tarl is gathering up different cows. This is Vega and this is Ox of Agonis. I think that's a wonderful piece of art. And you can now ride the Gitrog monster, which is a cool tie into the set's mechanic, but I just find these things really fucking distracting from the, from the setting itself. Magic's greatest assets, even beyond its characters, has always been its world building. The reason that people enjoy going back to planes for exciting places like Lorwyn is not because there was planeswalkers there. Uh, maybe some legendary creatures are, uh, you know, um, the sort of thing that people clam before. But the world building and the fleshing out via art and flavor text and mechanical identity is something that magic has always done so well. It's one of the reasons I think Universes Beyond works within magic is that through flavor text, art, and the, the storytelling of a grokable ability that tells you a thing about a place or a card or a thing, I think all of those things can come together to explore different IPs. But having Marquesa in a, in, a, in, a, in a cowboy hat tell us that you should have folded when you had the chance, it feels so on the nose in terms of the motif and the theme that's kind of embarrassing. Now, I'm not saying that all these villains can't show up for whatever reason. There might even be a big setup that feels like it pays off down the line. But there's two things I want to say about this. One is it as a marketing strategy and two, the idea of payoff for fan service. Firstly, for a marketing strategy, I know that you want to show the splashy rares and shit like that. People don't want to see Deep Muck Desperado. Although I get you, I think a Homrid mercenary wearing a cowboy hat does interest people. But again, I'm still going to criticize it because it's just a, it's a crab person wearing a cowboy hat how is almost every creature in this set just either a varmint badger or similar like wildlife from the old west or a cowboy but the gin of fool's fall is such a, a rarity to find amongst the car previews right now a, a creature a mythical creature that might be here from another plane or inherently itself that isn't part of the tapestry of wearing a cowboy hat I'll come back to the mythology of the plane and what's there and what has been and some of that lampshading in a moment. So from a marketing perspective, no one wants to see my beloved Vengeful Townsfolk, a card that I think tells us a lot more about the world than any of these other rares with nondescript art and no flavor text. Like what does Slick Short show off actually show us? He's a bird wizard who has a gun, but it's not a gun because they can't do guns. They're doing lightning rifles. Yeah, that's right. They're called fucking rifles in the story. Uh, you can't make this shit up. So instead they show us things that will you know, get us going, get us frothing. Massive mythic reprints like Terror of the Peaks, which is again a reprint of a thing from another plane, but also all the characters that we think we know and love. Half of these characters we don't really know or love, if we're honest. They're, they're, they're caricatures, they're, they're, they're shallow. And then what that looks to do is to tell us very little about the world and make us feel like this might just be a theme park for characters that already existed. A themed patch or seasonal promotional event for characters that we already know. Corporate mascots wearing the latest top-down motif. It feels like a League of Legends event for that reason. Now, I think once the full set is out or you're opening a sealed pool in front of you and you've got Vengeful Townsfolk in your pool or Requisition Raid, where we basically learn through just being in front of us that the free striders ride giant chicken mounts, which is farcical and silly, but farcical and silly in a world-building and interesting way beyond hat on hair. But once we get to that point, this might feel a bit more cohesive and a bit more interesting, and a bit more, well, dare I say it, that they're actually building a world as opposed to putting a lot of characters that we know into a motif. But that's not how the marketing feels, right? When you're sat in it as a content creator or a deeply franchised player and you just see a lot of fucking names that you recognize that you don't understand why they're there and they're not explained, 
it's a problem. Again, a wider issue with magic, not just bespokely unique to this particular set. But on top of all that, the, the last point on that before we move on is that these characters being there and not being really explained, but only having references to themselves and their own cards, is kind of dumb. I'm really hoping over the last day as we go into this, we'll see cards with flavor text that references why Bruce Tarl or Marquesa are there. Obviously there are references to uh, the sleepy magey lady from um, World of Dream, but it's on her card or on her setup card, the card that has her name in it. Like, that's something that's still world building. I'm not dismissing that's not a thing, but I think having cards interconnectedly tell you a story that you can unravel and piece together as you build your decks and play is a lot more interesting than a card being like, look, sleepy lady put man to sleep. And then we have the fact that they are using the Western motif, this idea of, you know, the old West, and they're sanitizing it and sanding the edges off. There are no indigenous people. There are a nomadic race of people who move between planes, uh, coded uh, and through the use of cultural consultants to be like Native Americans. Annie Flash is an Atin, or uses the Atin language. Atin are nomadic human people who have found their way onto Thunder Junction. It was mentioned in the preview panel at Magic Con Chicago this would use cultural consultants to make sure that it wasn't insensitive. Honestly, I don't know where I sit on this decision to really just ignore the the heavy-handed underpinnings of this genre, but ultimately it's not a genre I care about, I'm, I'm, and I don't really have much knowledge or to, or insight into that sort of area. Part of me wonders that if they really want to avoid fleshing out like the native inhabitants of a wild west plane, why they didn't just like use another plane for the backdrop? In the same way that Markov Manor was Detective Fiction on Ravnica, couldn't they have done a heist or a, a villain collaboration or whatever it is on a different plane? Did they have to do it here? They could even do the heist on a different plane like Capenna, for example, and then added in elements of a moving train through the city or through the outlands of the city, and then add cowboy hats to that. They didn't have to do a whole plane on it, especially if they're not really committed to the bit anyway. Especially if they're committed to the idea of it being primarily a villain like set and the backdrop of it being the old west just happens to be a thing that's there as well. It all just feels so fucking muddy in terms of like, I assume the development for this set had some issues. Like it wasn't always this way. There was a villain set, there was a heist set, there was a cowboy set and it all got amalgamated at some point or, or crossed over. Things from one set became another and so on and so on. We end up with this, a set whose focus feels a little bit lost. It is undoubtedly the cowboy set, but it's the cowboy set in a very superficial way. Where the world building is just ski whiff and strange. Armored Armadillo, a one mana zero four armadillo with ward of one on the ability to get bigger based on its own toughness. An interesting magic card ready for a common, but it has flavor text where it says I always want to ride a low cannonball with legs. By, said by Kellen. Why would one of our main characters be referring to riding this when it's not a mount? When it doesn't actually reference the actual mechanic of mounting and riding other creatures in the setting that exists. To me, Armored Armadillo feels like it might have had its flavor text move from one thing to another or is something else in development. That's not necessarily a, an input or an insight into like the issues with the development of this set. For example, Armored Armadillo might have had its own frivolous, difficult design path. At one point, maybe Armored Armadillo also had the mount keyword and the saddle uh, text as well. Oh, the mount type in the saddle keyword, perhaps. That's not telling us the whole set is like this, but it's just one more example of things that leave me a bit confused in terms of world building and develop. Also a bit confused by Holy Cow was another one. I did tweet about this, but I, where I've been sick, I just didn't have the energy to deal with all the well actuallys. I can put this on YouTube and just not read the comments so I can do that. It's a three mana two, two with flash flying and when it ends the battlefield, Gain two life and scry one. It's an ox angel. Basically, it's quite a power crept common, not the best we've ever seen, but flash flying 2 2 with an upside into the battlefield trigger is pretty good. But on top of that, it's a holy cow. It's a, it's a pun. It's a silly pun. And I don't mind silly puns in magic. I've defended the silliness of um, MKM, of, um, of, of Murder at Carl of Manor, before in a video. But I am a little bit confused about what makes this holy. Who is worshipping this? What is this sacred to? In a set where the indigenous people have been not erased, but they've been transferred to be indigenous people from another plane coming here or some such nonsense that they decided to go with. Is it really the place to have a sacred cow? I don't, again, I'm no expert on Native American culture, but that just seems really odd to me. What a weird pick. But then again, with bovine intervention, there is this ongoing idea that somehow, somewhere, in some way, the cows of the plane are more powerful than we think they are. Again, I'm actually a little bit muddied about whether or not the cow in the image is turning the person 
into the cow, or the idea that the person in the image is becoming a cow that would join that cow. Then the flavor text asks that no one, no one could prove that the ox did it. Did what? The destruction? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I may have been too harsh at this point, but I actually get really confused the more I look closely at these cards. Like, they only deserve a surface level reading because the moment you start to even, like, inspect them a, a small amount, I'm a little bit confused. It's super boomer of me, but like, the high brow concept of swords to plowshares and how that translates across multiple settings is compared to bovine intervention where I'm not even sure if it's the cow that we should be scared of, if it's a, a little hint or a window into the fact that the cows of the plane are powerful. I don't know. It's 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 an interesting comparison in my opinion. The set isn't all bad. I really like these extended border um, Fastlands uh, with the, the really cool like Wild Wild West train. I'm sorry, it does remind me of Wild Wild West. I don't know why. I, I think this is kind of cool. But that said, it reminds me of the trailer and the trailer sucked. Like, I, God, there's some artists that have worked on this, I guess. But let's be honest, compared to like every other trailer we've had from Magic in its entire time of having these CGI trailers, including the Korea one, this is by far the worst, both in visual design, what it tells us about the set, giving us a feeling for the set. I, I, yeah, it doesn't vibe with me at all. Look, I'm coming into this not enjoying Westlands anyway, so I know that my, my takeaway from it wasn't going to be that strong. I was probably going to bounce off it regardless, but I can't also help but feel that the whole thing feels a little bit shallow. I think the new Archangel of Tides art is fucking dope, but this angel looks genuinely sick with the guns thing, I think. It just reminds me that Magic tries to pretend that guns aren't allowed, which is kind of stupid. And if we move away from flavor and theme for a moment, I actually think the cards in the set are full of really interesting, powerful, and intricate designs. I'll talk more about this as we start to play with the cards, but I think all the spree cards seem very very good especially the rares and up and i also really really like just like a hate bear that allows you to exile a spell on the stack and then make your opponent's stuff cost more there's some cool stuff in here but like every card just uh, makes me ask questions and not in a good way this is one that i've seen other people pick up on there's like smuggler's surprise shows like a wooden horse are they well why are we doing a trojan horse motif in the uh the old west set now look we've had the trojan horse before to go back to my beloved theros and talk about how the crowing horse is a fantastic representation of that story what i like to believe here from a headcanon perspective is that these smugglers who are surprising people with this wooden horse that they're climbing out of are actually therosian inhabitants that have moved to the plane and done this but i guess that's just something we've got to make up or pull out of our ass because there's just no way of truly knowing Hell, the people climbing out don't even look like they're from Theros. And on that note, can I just pull your attention to a Crowin Phalanx, a forgettable 4 mana 3 3 Vigilant Creature, Human Soldier, with a red activated ability that buffs its front end, shields up, spears out, heal set, hearts firm. This is a common, oh sorry, this is an uncommon from Born of the Gods. Now, Born of the Gods had all sorts of problems itself. The, the set kind of sucked from a power level and mechanical perspective. But I just want to point out what this uncommon does when you open your sealed pool or your draft boosters. It tells us that the Acroans, which is one of the civilizations, one of the places that one of the one of the lands, the, the environs, the biomes are named after. The Acroans work in phalanxes that are familiar to us, like the tortoiseshell formations that we see in popular culture depictions of the Romans, or how the Spartans would fight. They're in red and white as well, which evokes Boros. It evokes that warrior legion feel that we know and understand through the years of magic layering up these intricate thematic layerings upon the colours and the colour combinations. I'm really hoping I'll eat crow on this, and I'm really hoping we'll see some cards come into Thunder Junction that will do this. That tell us a bit about the world via our understanding of popular culture that it's riffing on because that's what Theros was it was a riff on the Greek mythology but also through its colour pairings and usage of flavour text to tell us what it is and what it's doing and really set up a part of that environment to feel a certain way like a chrome phalanx is very vanilla but I think it does things really I guess subtly and I even things that subtle so that was not the right word but does it softly and gently in a way it doesn't make me want to like facepalm Meanwhile, Lone Shark is a funny riff in a way. And it's nice to see a character not wearing a fucking cowboy hat. But Lone Shark is about as uncard as we get in a main set. And I don't mind these existing, but there's just a fucking lot of them inside this set. I welcome the jokes. I love the jokes. My entire fucking career is based around talking about magic, criticizing magic, and joking about magic. Those three things combined make me into Captain Planet. But Lone Shark... I don't know. All it's missing is a really fucking stupid bit of flavor text too. I defended this stuff in, 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 in Call of Mana, but I feel like it's just, it's a little bit more of a bearing here. I think in Call of Mana, I could accept them stu sticking stupid hats and fucking weirds and stuff. But here, when we see a Marauding Sphinx, where I know so little about the plane and I have to ask, okay, I guess there's an interesting question of what plane did this Sphinx come from? But why did this Sphinx become a rogue? Are the only people coming to this plane the ones looking to rob and steal from people? I guess that helps for the old like, outlaws and the old like comical farcical pop culture feel of the old west where everyone's robbing each other blind but i really would like some contrast by comparison uh, some people living in one of the towns or cities that aren't a bunch of cunts i think new characters like vadmir newblood 
like quite literally new blood. I think they're gonna get drowned out by all the other shit that's coming in from other sets and other places. And that brings me to my final point of like, you need to create new space magic. You need to create new stories. Now to say you don't do this is, would be completely unfair. The return to Ixalan was not just simply retreading, it was reforming what we knew about Ixalan and making it interesting. I found original Ixalan to be boring as shit, and new Ixalan was interesting. Like mechanical gnomes, journey to the center of the earth, the old invasions and shit, all that stuff was really cool. If we do, themed genre set set on an existing plane or we go to another plane that then just has a bunch of fucking people from other planes on it you aren't gonna have much of a well to return to later down the line we've got some good shit coming up we got bloomborough we got duskmorn and we've got new places to explore i just really hope they are new places to explore and not just like reskinned characters into some sort of fucking motif like bunny ear jace or god we have seen fox jace haven't we it's gonna happen isn't it oh, what if duskmorn just everyone wearing like leather jackets and bandanas and listening to acdc or whatever they think stranger things fans want to see in 2024 i'm gonna wait and i'm gonna be excited dustmorn's really excited for me as a big fan of like horror films and shit i'm quite hyped for this but i'll actually close out the video now the video's gone for way too long fucking that's gonna be a very long video i think this settled in better and do all of the stuff it's doing if the previews were arranged slightly differently if we saw the cool enigmatic rares and mythics that tell us about the plane then some flavor text comments and then they reveal that people are coming here pad it out in a way that you can tell a story over that week period otherwise what's the fucking point in padding it over a week if you can't be bothered to do this wizards just dump all that shit on one day i know it creates more in engagement uh, for your brand, but just, I don't know, have some fucking fun with it. But beyond that, I'm gonna say this. This is a drum that I've banged many a time before. Thunder Junction should have been two sets. Three set blocks did suck. Theros is a good example of where they just ran out of steam by the time we got to Jones and Nyx, and it all could have been compacted into two sets, and putting them down is more favorable in the history of magic. I think setting up a world like Thunder Junction and then doing your heist within Thunder Junction with these new characters coming in would have been a lot more rewarding and fulfilling. It would have given us a payoff. It would have set up, as I mentioned very much earlier in this video, set up for some fan service later. The reason the fan service worked in things like March of the Machines or War of the Spark is because we're building to it. We've done like multi-year arcs to get to the point where we're like, oh shit, it's our favorite legendary old planes walk up fighting Nicol Bolas or fighting the Frexions or whatever. Slightly avoiding the Gear Monster was a bit farcical, but like it was early in a sense of these are two characters people love and to see them come together and put the differences aside of one being a monstrous monster and one being a, uh, a paladin then coming together and fighting off the fractions to save their home plane was fucking cool in a dumb fan service kind of way being able to set up storylines and then pay them off later as part of a two block structure is a really strong way to tell stories people don't just like verbally diarrhea all the information into you even i structure my videos even if i ramble like i'm doing now murders of carl of mana could have done the same as well we could have had the murder in the first act and then the revelations and the escalation in the second act instead it was clambered together and some people found out who died before they'd even seen any of the story spotlight cards the previous season was a mess and the storytelling through that was poor and the big irony in all of this my friends some of you are thinking wizards will never go back to this well they were going to right outlaws at thunder jungle was initially planned to be two sets one set was this and then one set was the the heist at the end or the, the opening of the vault and all the gear that they found and maybe some other stuff too and because aftermaths um the entire reception was bad the little sort of micro set they tried to do as a bullet point end to march the machine not because of uh, people not wanting to have a bullet point point but the fact that at the end it didn't feel like it really gave us much of a juicy story element and the small boosters pissed everyone off too they overcorrected. They crammed it into Outlaw Junction, and now we've got a set that has no room to breathe, even under its own weight. And we're going to have cards that are going to be all sorts of weird rarities for limited and just general collecting because then they're going to be in a special, special slot. We've got three different special slots in this. We've got news, relics, and we've got um, special guests. It's kind of wild, actually, when you say that out loud. Wild at the Wild West. Either way, I don't think they need to do two sets for everything. Like, Ixalan worked. I don't think I'd really want to stretch that out across two sets, especially if we're returning somewhere. We have to return and do two sets. But when you're doing, first exploring a plane, like somewhere like the, the old fucking West, where we haven't even got to the cool part, there's a vault that might be a crashed alien spaceship. That's my theory, anyway. A crashed alien spaceship that was found on this junction road between the planes. Why are we not setting up and expanding and exploring that part of the universe a bit more before we start sticking Marquesa and fucking... Tysa or whatever the fuck else is in this. I can't even remember. There's so many names from the <laughs> the front page of VDH Rec that I can't even remember who's in it and who's not. So there's an irony there. They were going to do it, but then they didn't want to do it in the special way that they wanted to do it. And it's weird, right? I don't think epilogue boosters are necessarily a cash grab as a sense. They kind of feel like, in some ways, initially cording off part of the original set to sell you later on. What I'm saying is cordon off parts, but flesh them out. Let's have fucking expanded world design and world building plus an expanded part of story and the cool story spotlights and reveals and shit. I just think it would make magic a lot more enjoyable than 
whatever this is. Anyway, that's my rambles about all of the issues and all of the feelings I've had about Family Junction. I do acknowledge my present biases of not being into cowboy fiction, getting home to see previews as I was jet lagged from America and then getting a stinking cold. All of these things are built up to probably put me not in the best of moods to receive this. So I'm trying to not be too overbearing and harsh. If you think I was, let me know in the comment section below and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.